We have spoken frequently in this course about promises and the conditions under which promises are and are not enforceable. Indeed, we usually think of contract laws primarily concerning promises. Today, we're going to talk about related but slightly different concerns that are also integral to contract law. These are representations and warranties. What's a representation? Representation concerns facts or circumstances related to proposed transaction. They are not the same as promises. One helpful way to distinguish between the two is to remember that while promises are forward-looking, representations generally involve past or present facts about the world. Consider a potential agreement to sell a used car. The seller's promise is that she will deliver the car. She may make many factual representations about the car in the process. She might say, it is blue, it has 50,000 miles on it, it has a small dent on the rear door. Those examples are all likely express representation. The seller expressly or explicitly informs the buyer of those facts about the car. But just as we saw with promises, Representations can be either expressed or implied. Most sellers implicitly represent, for instance, that they own the things they are selling and that those things are of reasonable quality. Moreover, it's possible for explicit promises to throw off implicit representations. When I promise to deliver a car, I implicitly represent that I presently intend to perform that promise. That's how the doctrine of promissory fraud is possible. Conversely, explicit representations can throw off implicit promises. When I represent that my car was only driven to church on Sunday, I implicitly promise or warrant that my representation is true. Explicit promises or explicit representations can throw off a host of implicit representations or promises. And part of the task of being trained in contracts law is being able to hear these implicit utterances. We can think of warranties, on the other hand, as a special kind of promise. A warranty promises that a person's representations are true. Judge Learned Hand explained in a Second Circuit case from 1946, Metropolitan Coal versus Howard, that a warranty, quote, amounts to a promise to indemnify the promisee for any loss if the fact warranted proves untrue, for obviously the promisor cannot control what is already in the past. In other words, if a representation proves false, the party who made it has breached his or her warranty that all representations of fact are true. The representation of fact in question, however, must become a term of the contract in order for the warranting party to be liable. In some, then, a warranty is made by one party to another about existing or past facts that are knowable, but not necessarily known, and that become a term in the contract. Now, sadly, people use the word warranty at times as a synonym for a forward-looking promise. Hyundai has a warranty that its transmission will not break for 100,000 miles. One could try to fit this warranty talk into the traditional definition of learned hand and others, saying that Hyundai has represented that it's selling the type of car that has a transmission that will last for 100,000 miles. But it's easier to distinguish between warranties that promise that representations are true and warranties that promise that goods will not break uh, in specified ways in the future. Warranties are very important because they allocate risk. The party who makes a representation bears the risk that the representation made will prove, quote, not in accord with the facts, unquote. How does this allocation of risk compare to the mistake doctrines we've earlier discussed? Well, mistake doctrines tend to let sellers out of contracts where there are basic mistakes that increase the value of the thing traded. Think of Sherwood v versus Walker's. And the mistake doctrines let buyers out of contracts where there are basic mistakes that decrease the value of the thing traded. Think of the Lenawee case. 
That is, you're let out, the buyer or the seller, unless the contract allocates the risk in, in, to the other side. A seller making a representation is one of the ways that the parties can allocate a risk to the seller or to the buyer. Warranties, unsurprisingly, can also be express or implied. The UCC's section 2313 establishes three ways sellers of goods can create express warranties. First, any affirmation of fact the seller makes that relates to the goods being sold and becomes part of the basis of the bargain creates an express warranty that the goods will conform to that affirmation. Second, any description of the goods that becomes part of the basis of the bargain creates an express warranty that the goods will conform to that description. And third, any sample or model of the goods, which is made part of the basis of the bargain, creates an express warranty that the whole of the goods will conform to the sample or to the model. The UCC emphasizes further that sellers do not have to specifically intend to make a warranty or need use or need use words like warranty or guarantee in order to create an express warranty. Indeed, because any agreement must involve some minimum description of the goods being transacted in, in order to be specific enough to be enforceable, every contract will necessarily entail some express warranty. If you're trying to have a contract to buy a bicycle, it's very hard to have it uh, not make at least a description that what is being purchased is a bicycle. But the UCC Section 2313 also specifies certain statements that don't create express warranties. Affirmations of the value of the goods or statements that only purport to be the seller's opinion or commendation of the goods. These statements regarding opinion or commendation are in effect just puffing. But I find it annoyingly ambiguous that the UCC provision says that, quote, an affirmation merely of the value of the goods, unquote, does not create an express warranty. An affirmation about the value of the goods, to my mind, is not mere. It seems to go to the central basis of the bargain. If a seller says that a baseball card has a market value of $45, that should create an express warranty because market value is falsifiable. Even saying that a baseball card has a value of $45 should, to my mind, create an express warranty that would be violated if the market value is substantially lower. Saying that a painting has a high value, on the other hand, might be mere puffing. The section doesn't distinguish between these different scenarios. Luckily, comment 8 to the section says that with regard to false statements of value, quote, the possibility is left open that a remedy may be provided by the law relating to fraud or misrepresentation. The UCC also establishes in three separate provisions three important implied or default warranties. The first of these, Section 2312, is the implied warranty of title, which applies to all sales. The second of these, 2314, is the implied warranty of merchantability, which applies only to merchants. This provision states that in a contract for the sale of goods, the seller, as if a merchant, impliedly warrants those goods will be merchantable with respect to the goods of that kind. The core meaning of merchantability is basically that the goods are fit for the ordinary purposes for which such goods are used. The third of these default warranties is section 2315, and it's the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. This comes up with buyers who disclose that they need goods for a particular purpose. The particular purpose is distinct from the ordinary purpose we just mentioned with respect to merchantability. It concerns a specific use by the buyer that is peculiar to the nature of the buyer's business or use of the goods and not just the ordinary use of the goods. 
Section 2315 explains that there is an implied warranty the goods will be fit for that particular purpose where the seller at the time of contracting has reason to know any particular purpose for which the goods are required and that buyer is relying on the seller's skill or judgment to select or furnish suitable goods. 2315 is another circumstance where making a representation may impose duties on the other contractor. We already discussed how making a representation may create a duty on the other contractor to correct your mistake. But with Section 2315, making a representation as to why you require a good can create a duty on skilled sellers, at least, to provide goods that conform to that requirement. These three provisions are default rules. Parties can contract around them if they wish, but the UCC in Section 2.3.16 also lays out altering rules. The second order legal rules regulating the ways in which parties can disclaim or limit the warranties or remedies for breach of these warranties. Subsection 2, for instance, says that in order to exclude or modify the implied warranty of merchantability, the contractual language must mention merchantability. And in the case of a writing, it must be a conspicuous statement. Similarly, to exclude or modify the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose, the exclusion must be a writing and be conspicuous. But subsection 2 is subject to, to subsection 3, which states more broadly that all implied warranties can be excluded by expressions such as, as is, or with all faults, or other language which in common understanding calls the buyer's attention to the exclusion of warranties and makes plain that there is no implied warranty. So even though subsection 2 says that waiver of the warranty of merchantability must mention merchantability, subsection 3 says mention that such mentions of merchantability are not necessary if the contract includes as is or similar uh, waiver language. Further and, imp and importantly, the UCC denies buyers protection of implied warranties if goods have defects about which the buyer knew or should have known. Quote, when the buyer before entering into the contract has examined the goods or the sample or model as fully as he desired or has refused to examine the goods, there is no implied warranty with regard to defects which an examination ought in the circumstances to have revealed to him. You probably noticed warranty provisions in the agreements for purchases you've made for hard goods like your computer or smartphone. These clauses have become quite standard across the uh, various industries. They, they, these clauses generally disclaim implied warranties and expressly warrant the goods against defects in material and workmanship. Further, they usually limit the remedies for breach of the warranties to just repairing or replacing the product. That is, that they promise to either repair the defective good or replace the defective parts. And also, they, these uh, provisions tend to set a limit on the amount of time in which claims under the warranties can be made, and they exclude liability uh, for uh, contractual damages. But the capacity of companies to contract around liability in this manner is at least a little circumscribed. Imagine you purchase a product that uh, uh, it becomes defective and after several attempts by the manufacturer to repair or uh, replace, the product still doesn't work. Even though the agreement for the product states that your remedies are limited to repair or replacement of defective parts, the UCC section 2719 provides that when a remedy, quote, fails of its essential purpose, unquote, a buyer may seek damages for the defective product using the default uh, remedies of the UCC. So if you attempt, uh, attempt repair and replacement time and time again and it continues to fail to put the product back into working condition, you might be able to recover full UCC damages. 
So what have we learned? We've learned about the important role of representations of fact in contract law. And we won't forget that representations of fact are distinct from promises. We've learned that representation in contracts throw off implied warranties and that because all contracts must contain some representations, all contracts entail some kinds of at least implied warranties. We've learned these warranties allocate risk to the representing party and so sellers can be liable when their representations turn out to be false. We talked about the express warranties and implied warranties that the UCC sets out and about the UCC's altering rules, the provisions that limit the ways to contract around those default rules.